Hello, beautiful lights, and welcome to another episode of From a Medium's Perspective. Today we have an interesting topic, but before I tell you what it is, I want to remind everyone of that feeling that we get. None of us like to be blamed or punished for something that we never did. You know, maybe as a child, you might have been blamed for something that you never did, or maybe you do things in your adult life and people have preconceived ideas about what it is that you do and judge you before they get to know you as a person. Preconceived ideas create a sense of separation. They make us blind to the totality of truth. In developing your mediumship and psychic ability, it's very important to let go of preconceptions of intellect. It's important to be able to let that go as you read and feel the truths and symbols and interpret things in the energies of the people that are in front of you. Just as important as letting go of your ego. We talk a lot about leaving your ego behind, but it's also important to leave our preconceptions behind. And today, we're going to be talking about witches and Wicca. And even more specifically, we're going to be talking about ghosts and angels and the afterlife and how that is seen and perceived from a Wiccan perspective. You're going to learn some things you might not know about Wicca. My guests today are Gavin and Yvonne Frost. They're founders of both the church and the school of Wicca. And before I start, I want to tell you a little bit about them. You know you've made a difference in the world when you can be found on Wikipedia. (laughs) Someday, medium Tracy Lockwood, radio show host, may be there. But right now, Gavin Frost is there. Gavin Frost is a doctor of physics and mathematics. He is also a Wiccan priest and he's a prominent member of the American Wiccan community. He and his wife, Yvonne, founded the church and school of Wicca in 1968. And you might be wondering, well, okay, but it's actually a really big deal because what they pushed through had to do with freedom of religion, and that's something good for all of us. Gavin is currently the Archbishop of the Church of Wicca, and a director of the School of Wicca. Gavin and Yvonne have authored several books on magic, on Wicca, and on related subjects such as the magic power of witchcraft. Gavin has appeared on national television shows like Phil Donahue, PM Magazine, Tom Snyder's Tomorrow Show, and more. They've really been active in neo-pagan community events like Stones Rising, Sirius Rising, Pagan Pride Day, and the Starwood Festival. And they've been in newspaper and magazine articles from way back. Gavin received his doctorate and went into aerospace industry. My second husband was an aerospace engineer, too. It's a tough field. It's a very cerebral field. Gavin worked with de Havilland Aircraft Corporation and investigated the effects of long-wave infrared radiation on missiles. And with Canadair in Montreal, he worked on the Canadian Missile Program. He joined their training and simulation group and got to travel all over the world. He ultimately moved to California for a while. He became senior project engineer and had worked on our U.S. military's F-104 radar systems. Bright, bright man. He was initiated into Wicca in 1951 at the Nine Maidens, which is that stone circle site that is in Boscadanan. I don't know how to say it, B-O-S-K-E-D-N-A-N, Cornwall, England. And he investigated the ancient monoliths of Stonehenge, which are of great fascination to many people because of their antiquity and because of the energies they have, the people that built them. And he's had a keen interest in ancient people and the origins of the old religion. He studied shamanic practices in Chile 
and researched the truths and fictions of Charles G. Leland's Aradia, which is the gospel of witches. He wanted to know what's real and what's Memorex, (laughs) you know. And in Munich, Germany, he became fascinated with the subject of German sorcery and joined a group of Zauberers. Zauberer is the German word for magician, sorcerer, wizard. Shaman, wizard, magician, all of them are healers, energy workers, working with the energies of the earth. And he and Yvonne met in 1966. She was a member of Mensa. And if you don't know what Mensa is, it is the High IQ Society. So she's no shoddy mind herself. She was a graduate of Fullerton Junior College. And because they shared an interest in the occult or the things that are unknown, the mysteries and the unseen aspects of life, they both walked an alternative spiritual path. They came together and they moved to St. Louis and founded the Church and School of Wicca two years later in 1968. And at that time, they started a correspondence school teaching witchcraft as a spiritual path, along with astro travel, sorcery, astrology, and psychic healing through the mail to a worldwide student body. The church earned tax-exempt status in 1972, again a coup for the freedom of religion in the United States. And with the publication of the Witch's Bible and later the magic power of witchcraft, they grew and they've continued to prosper and make a difference. They haven't been active leaders of the church since 1980, but they continue as clergy and heads of the School of Wicca. And so I'd like to welcome Yvonne and Gavin Frost. Welcome today. Hi, Tracy. Tracy, it's wonderful to work with you. Just a a pleasant experience. (laughs) Thank you. You listed all those wonderful shows I've been on, I should add. That Yvonne was on the mall with me. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. Credit where credit is due. Thank you so much. I'm just curious and wanted to know, you know, what's the proper way to address a Wiccan priest or priestess? Would you say father or reverend, pastor? What do you use as a term? Usually it's hey you. <laughs> or their first name. <laughs> or first name. Is there seriously like a proper title? We, we really don't use titles. We try to avoid being above or different than anyone that we're trying to talk to, you know. Yes. Well, the first question that I wanted to ask you is people that have been around people that are practicing Wicca or have studied it often use the term blessed be. What about that? How did that originate, and what's the importance of it? Why do people say, blessed be? We say it as we part from our dear friends. We say, merry meet and merry part, blessed be until we meet again. And that summarizes the idea, it makes me merry, makes me merry in my heart to meet you and let us be merry when we part until we meet again, and blessed be. Yeah, I was just wondering. Sometimes our understanding of a subject comes down to a matter of definition. For instance, non-mediums define mediumship as calling and summoning the dead. And uh, mediums think of, I understand, it's just scary, you know, come to me now, you know, kind of thing. But (laughs) mediums think of mediumship like having an antenna or a particular sensitivity to a vibration, sort of like... I don't know, a drug-sniffing dog (laughs) that's been trained to pick up on a particular scent or something, and tuning our vibration to a wider spectrum of information and just paying attention to a wider spectrum of information than the average everyday Joe and Jill do. What we don't understand, we can really fear. You know, terminology throws people off too. For instance, the Arabic translation of the word God is a law. But Mm -hmm. non-Arabic speaking people might think that Muslims worship a different God than they do. They're kind of oblivious to the fact that Allah or God is the same monotheistic God of Abraham, Isaac, and Moses, the same as in Judaism and Christianity. And I was thinking as I prepared for the show that as far as mainstream Christianity goes, the so-called witch of Endor that's mentioned in the Old Testament with... um, 
I think it was King Saul, must have had a pretty powerful effect to retain a reputation that surpassed uh, <laughs> the other laws of the Old Testament and is still referred to today in favor of the New Testament references of spiritual and psychic gifts. You know, the word of knowledge, intuition, the the discerning of spirits, which is mediumship, tongues and interpretation, which is channeling. And I was thinking, you know, you don't damn someone to hell for eating shrimp, but shrimp is forbidden in the Old Testament, too. So (laughs) we tend not to attach a gender to something which is beyond thought. Yes, yes, absolutely. God, ultimately, the word is beyond thought. Uh, you cannot say it's male or female. Right, right. And speaking of that concept of the divine, take a minute and tell us how do Wiccans view the divine in general? I know everybody's individually understanding things at their own level and perception, but in general, how would you describe the divine perspective to... I think we have the same problems that everybody else has, and that is that we can't really define it. It's beyond definition. Yes. Sometimes I tell people we don't really know what or who the God is. It's not because we're evil. It's just like a chimpanzee sitting in a calculus classroom. A chimpanzee doesn't get calculus yet. Not because it's evil or inferior. It's just not ripened enough to yes. the concepts. Oh, I like that. And Yeah, I like to do metaphors and and bring things down to where they are accessible. But if we just open ourselves and say, guide, please give me what you see is a strong feature accessible to me. Lately, I've been coming very much into psychic healing. It's just a matter of opening. It's there. Something is there for us all. We've been forbidden it for centuries so that we'd have to cross somebody's palm with silver, but that's another matter. <laughs> anybody, anybody should be able to feel their own energy by crossing their own palms. If you hold one hand up, let's say your left hand up, and cross the other hand by pointing the fingers of the other hand at your palm, you should be able to feel a little energy transfer. Oh, definitely. Yes. It's in us all. Yes. It's in us all, and we've been denied. We're very intrigued recently by these programs called Brain Games, because they're also expanding people's awareness in a non-threatening way. Yeah. You know, I was reading some science that had defined us as protean clouds, like clouds of light particles, and they were talking about how our mind our perception actually isn't even resident in our body, that the brain functions almost like a machine to divert and connect and do things within the body system. But our mind, our perception is in that sort of cloud of light that we are. And I thought, bingo, getting there. (laughs) (laughs) The word aura comes to mind. Uh Yes, absolutely. There are those who see auras, and I envy them a little bit, although our daughter said, no, I stopped seeing them when I saw a black one. Oh. She shut her ability down. They're very interesting to look at because it gives such an immediate insight into the major themes that are going on for an individual. I do see them. People ask me, are you always looking at those? And I'm like, no, because I'm doing whatever I'm doing. I'm shopping or eating. You know, I don't want to be open like that all the time. With Wicca, the understanding of the word witch has such a negative connotation. You know, they hear that and probably they have like the witch from the Wizard of Oz pop in mind or witch burning at the stake in Salem or was it the three witches in Shakespeare's Yes, yes. Yes, 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 yeah. And there's really a great deal of misunderstanding. And I guess the first one I wanted to clear up is like, do witches worship Satan? No, absolutely not. Satan is a Christian demigod, if you like. And so why should we worship somebody else's negativity? There you go. (laughs) Yay! Most of this bad propaganda is holdovers from the 16th century. 
when there was a big letterhead came to town and wanted to be the only game in town and had to condemn and propagandize everybody else. And that yes. was us. So we yeah. got a big bad reputation, and it still holds on from the 16th century. Yeah, in Native American traditions, the concept of Mother Earth and Father Sky, yeah. um, those are the energies, the male and female energies of all creation. How do you view that part of things? We agree 100% with the Native American tradition, or what we should call the First American tradition. Yeah, First Nation. First the American, first nation. yes, okay. yes. The Mother Earth concept, the Earth supports us all, and the way we're treating it nowadays, it's not going to carry on treating us all, you know, just raping it on a continuous basis. And the more attention we pay to it, the better off we will be. That brings me to some of the traditions of Wicca honoring that connection with the Earth. Um, tell us a little bit about what those might be. Let me start with my favorite thing, two favorite things, and I'll be very brief if I can. No, try, no, can we've got time. When we think about the principles by which we live, the first one is called the Wiccan Read. Read is advice or counsel. The Wiccan Read says, if it harm none, do what you will. And the none includes myself, of course. If it harm none, do what you will. Is that where the do no harm comes from? Yes. yes. And uh, Gavin, you were saying that includes the self as well? Yeah. Don't do something stupid and harm yourself. Yes. And so, Yvonne, again, say the phrase, the first read. If it harm none, do what you will. If it harm none, if, do if what you will. None, yes. What you will. And, of course, that just flushes away all the phony little laws we're supposed to follow just to keep somebody happy or so somebody can say, aha, I've got you now. You are just obeying my phony little law, which means nothing in terms of if it harm none. Yes, well, kindness and love and operating in a way like in the environment, call it a small carbon footprint. <laughs> yes, yes, <laughs> you know. oh yes. So what yes. are the three laws we do away with, Yvonne? The petty little laws that are, are synthetically set up so that somebody can say, aha, I've got you now. What yes. The three laws? Yeah. You said it. I didn't say three. I said it is the first law, and there are two that come to mind. If it harm none, do what you will. That is the first guiding principle. Uh -huh. And the underlying fact is that we are not allowed to know about progressive reincarnation because we are here on Earth as in a school and this lifetime, when I'm Yvonne Frost, is a semester in school. And what's called death is actually graduation. Yeah. So we go to the other side and we talk over our experiences this time, the term papers we have written, with our guide, and it makes sense of them. And then when it's time and when the right identity opens up, we'll come back to this planet for an, or some other for another incarnation until we finish and really graduate and go on to higher levels. Yes, yes. You know, the more readings I do, the more energies I connect with, the more I realize that is the way that it is, because most mainstream Americans, well, maybe now it's shifting more toward an open thought in that direction, but reincarnation when I was growing up was kind of a weird idea, but it makes perfect sense. That kind of weird idea was spoken of 15,000 years ago in the Hindu Vedas, where it specifically says you will come back. Yes, yes. It's not a punishment. It's just another lesson. Right, right. I think that that's really important, Yvonne, that you just pointed out, that it isn't a punishment. That Go ahead and expound on that just a second, if you will. Yes, I think of the Buddha saying, all is suffering. No, sir, sorry, I don't perceive it that way from my embittered perspective. It's not all about suffering. There are blessings like friendships and glimpses of understanding that we get. The aha moments when the little light bulb goes on at the top of the head. We are here to learn. And yes. I, when I'm standing in the ruins of something in my life, if when I have shed the healing tears, I say to myself, well, that's one term paper I will not have to write 
next semester. Yes. And it's, it's a very healing and reassuring thought. Of course, nobody else has to believe, has to subscribe to my interpretation, but it comforts me and it helps me make sense of my life. She so, can say that because we believe very strongly that men reincarnate first as men and eventually... If they really learn everything they can, they can come back as a woman. Hmm. Oh, that's interesting. That's interesting, actually. Women have the chance to learn more than men do. I mean, men cannot have children, so they can never experience the same type of love that a mother does. Of course, there's a balance of masculinity and femininity within each of us. But thinking strictly in terms of sort of the archetype of man, not necessarily male, but male energy tends to be very direct, point to point, possibly more aggressive. Just Mm -hmm. even the body structure of a man is more physically oriented that direction. And then as a woman or a feminine energy, we tend to feel... I'm not saying that men don't feel. That's absolutely not true. What I mean is like there is that sort of nurturing and the typical sort of hunter-gatherer male and more the hunter is the male and the gatherer is the woman kind of thing. Like I've also heard of it as spaghetti. Men are dry (laughs) spaghetti and women are cooked spaghetti. I don't know if that's advanced or not. (laughs) We're just like in a lot of trouble going down this track. (laughs) Right, I know, right. And again, I want to stress that it isn't defined by physical gender. It's an energy. Yeah, very interesting. Well, I don't know about that. I don't know that I feel more evolved. Some days you just want to stomp on something, don't you? (laughs) There are those days. There are those days. There are those days. (laughs) Now, there's a little side light here. Yes. As human spirits, human level spirits, as they move along the scale from male to female, sometimes a baby is born not quite complete, not quite matured fully to full babyhood. And the dad will say at the door, is this a boy or a girl? Is this a boy or a girl? And the doctor can't read the baby and see definite defining characteristics. So he flips a coin, the doctor does, and with one touch of the scalpel, he decides the gender of mm, the baby of for that this soul. semester. Yes. And doctors make mistakes too. Yes, so sometimes do. a baby is assigned another gender than its natural one that it matured into between semesters at school. And you know, I think too, like if we've been here so many times, I'm pretty sure we've played all roles. We've been feminine, we've been masculine, we've been gay, we've been straight, we've been... By now, I don't think it matters. <laughs> Do you know what I'm saying? Like, well, the thing, we're thing is, if you, if you have learned your lesson in a particular gender, in a particular form, then you don't have to do that again. Do you think that, for instance, I have a memory of a past life as a commander of an army kind of thing, and it wasn't a good feeling, actually. It was a feeling of tremendous responsibility and realizing the sacrifices that were made for each of my men to come out on the field and leave their families, leave their comfort of their lives to potentially not return. That feeling kind of resided with me. I label myself a straight woman, but I have so many memories from that time. Sounds to me as if you were in an incarnation, which was probably the last one as a male, because you were having emotional, caring feelings, which are more naturally attached to the female. So it looks to me as though that was your last one as male, and the next time you came back as a woman. Oh, very interesting. I don't know. I hadn't really thought of it like a continuum. Do you think it's a cycle in a sense? Maybe we start out male and then as we move through lifetimes, that feminine energy enters. And then do you think we do male at a higher vibration? No. We believe that after you've gone through the female thing, you may come back as a higher being either on this planet or on another there's a suspicion in our minds that something like a dolphin has a higher feeling than we do. Yeah, and so, not know, all beings come from Earth. <laughs> Word. <laughs> you, know, you start out as an amoeba or something very, very tiny, 
and gradually when you learn how to run an amoeba around, you get enough knowledge to run something slightly larger around. I actually remember being plankton. If you've missed the first half of the show and would like to listen to it, or if you'd like to listen to any of our past episodes, you can find them on my YouTube channel. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel. It's Medium Tracy Lockwood. Or you can find them listed on the radio show slash YouTube page of my website at MediumTracyLockwood.com. If you want to reach our guests, Wicca.org, W-I-C-C-A dot org. And I wanted to ask you about ghosts. What's the thought on ghosts from a Wiccan perspective? Let me tell you a story that happened to me on our front porch here in West Virginia. There are little neighbor girls who live near to us. One has moved away. But they came to me one day because they know that we are gasp deviant. And they said, Angel and Hannah both said, we have seen a little Indian girl just across the river. She is wandering around loose, and she doesn't have anybody. And I said, all right, girls, let's sit here on the front porch for one moment of quiet, and I will ask my guide to come and find her and bring some of her people to her that were all killed as this nation was settled by the holy invaders from Europe. I said, let's just sit for a quiet moment and ask my guide respectfully to come in and see to that little girl. So I said to my guide, would you please find her people and connect her with them so she can go to her rightful place? And thank you. So the next day, 24 hours later, Hannah and Angel came back. And I said, do you see the little girl today? They said, no, she's gone. Aww. That was a ghost. We've had several experiences like that. We had one, we were called to a house in Boulder, Colorado, which was having a lot of trouble. It was things were falling off shelves and glasses were breaking and all sorts of odd things were happening. And so we sat and meditated and contacted another little girl. And she was furious because she couldn't go on. And she had been told that unless she learned her 12 times tables, she would never go to heaven. Oh, yes, isn't that a so She was stuck. Oh, so said, wow. We'll have somebody come and teach you the 12 times table. And the next day she was gone again. Mm. And then the people who owned the house were mad at us because they'd lost their ghost. Lost their bragging rights. <laughs> oh, <laughs> right, right. I know, it's terrible, like, thinking of the anguish of a soul becoming sort of like a game or a entertainment or some kind of spectator yeah. sport or something like that. It's just awful to treat those in the past that way. Ghosts usually occur because they're stuck. They've been told they can't go on or there's something missing that they have to do. There was a baby in Ohio who came, and at three months it was speaking Hindi. Mm. And it turned out that he had left some money for his wife, and he wanted her to know where it was. And so he communicated this to us, and we got it translated, and he disappeared. The baby went back to babbling along in baby talk. Oh, that is that is fantastic. What a great release. I guess that would have been a residual need from a past life traveling with that soul as they entered this yes. one. Yes, yes. I had another case in St. Louis where um, we were in a cellar in a house and the ghost came, uh, presence came, if you like, and it had left a treasure trove in a passageway It had been a smuggler and had left money in a box in the passageway. And when we found it, it picked up the table that we were sitting at, which had metal legs, and threw it against the wall with such force that it bent the table. Yes. The person's relief was so strong that the fact that his hidden trove had been found finally and could do some good to his descendants... Yes, you know, it is. It's a tremendous tension and it's very unsettling for most people when spirit becomes physical, maybe playing with the lights or popping noises or even physically appearing. 
it's quite startling when you expect them to sort of stay on that side. And I think you call it the invisible barrier. Usually in deep meditation, you can contact them or they can contact you. Oh, absolutely. And you must view mediumship or the communication of spirits. The Bible talks about it as the discernment of spirits. You must consider that a natural gift, as I do, that can be developed. Yes. It's been taken from us. Tracy, you know as well as we do, we all have something, some form of contact with the other side if we will only open to it. We can be so blessed and so fulfilled and so supported if we will just open. The law of attraction says if you go in with harmful intent, you'll attract unpleasant experiences. But if you go in with a benevolent, open mind to do good, that is what you will attract to yourself. It's yes. It's simple law of attraction. Yes, and I think that it's a tremendous release. You know, we often think about people here grieving over someone who has passed and wanting to talk to them to resolve things that might be going on in their life or in their mind about that relationship or circumstance, but yes. it's also the souls on the other side that need to be able to communicate and be able to be heard. I was yes, thinking yes, with heard. your example, first of all, I was admiring your mediumship, Gavin, <laughs> and no, Yvonne. It's just very common. Anybody can do it. Yes, it is, but not everybody tunes in, and so I always appreciate good antennas. <laughs> when I get near them. But I was thinking about someone listening might have thought, oh my God, table went across the, whoa, that's scary. But I think it's a misunderstanding of that release. Spirit does have a kinetic effect in this life. That's why they usually use something like electricity or something to communicate because it resonates with their vibration and brings that mesh between the other side to us so that we can get it. But when that tension of that treasure chest being found was released, it's sort of like if you've been pulling on a rope or pulling on a rubber band or something, maybe would be a good example. You let go, snap, you know. That was a physical evidence that that issue had been resolved. I'm personally glad that I haven't seen a table fly across the room because, you know, <laughs> well, I would have wait to. A little bit. You'll let it happen. <laughs> right. Well, I'm always startled. Anytime some physical phenomenon happened, and I was working on physical development for a while, and there were some really startling things that started to happen. A cat appeared in my bedroom, Ooh. a real one, like a real, real cat. Like I was yeah. allergic to it, actually. You know, it's well, just kind of wild, a continuum. Mm hmm. You need to think of something that they have the power to affect. In other words, they don't have a lot of power on this plane, but they can often affect things like a pendulum. I use a pendulum very easily. As long as you're fairly relaxed before you start to use it, you can detect these presences quite easily. Yes, and also, like we were talking about at the beginning of the show, kind of letting go of that preconception, not just ego, but intellect. It's not you lose your intellect and become a dummy. It's just that you are becoming neutral and relaxed so that you can receive that information. And it is easy. I think of it as going into another level of awareness. Yes. A different department. You have to figure some way of learning to totally relax. One very easy way, which we shouldn't talk about. Oh, well, yes. <laughs> Not on the show, but yes. I think everybody just got that. <laughs> that is an excellent way to relax. <laughs> when I was a Baptist. When I, I was I a Baptist? Well, yeah, that's I'm, not what I I'm expected now, to hear come out of your mouth. You recovered fairly quickly. I'm now in recovery. Yes. They used to talk about the eternal trinity, a three-part thing. The three-part thing that I have now shifted my mind to is the eternal trinity of guilt, shame, and fear, the big manipulators. Oh, yes. Guilt, shame, and fear. 
And honey, they just used to ram it down our Baptist throats. I've scraped it off my shoe. Yeah, yes, you did. And of course, not all people within any religion have exactly the same viewpoint, but collectively it can be damaging. Like the soul that believed that if she didn't learn her 12 timetable, I mean, oh my God, yeah. what a conscientious yeah. little girl that she cared enough and wanted to learn her tables and thought, well, I'll have to do that before I go. I just am always touched at the preciousness of the pure soul of people. But it's not about that. Let's talk about angels. What do you think about angels? How do you see them relative to spirits and guides? I don't know. There's a lot of fantasy and fiction, creative fiction that, that is marketed. I don't know whether angels really exist or whether they're just higher beings who mm-hmm. come to us and come down to our level where we can access them and give us information or guidance. Well, I like to think of them in the same way that the Hindus do, that in some other planes of existence, we can move between different planes. And one of the planes is a plane where you have these beings that are benevolent but cannot move on. And so they show their benevolence by trying to help us in this plane. There's a plane above that where the commonly thought of as God exists, And yet there's a plane above that where this undefinable, unknowable something exists, which caused this this whole thing to run. Yes, and the more I work and learn, the more I synchronize with that concept. That's very interesting. Mm -hmm. For me, as a medium, I have seen angels and different descriptors of it is a very common mistake of a beginning medium to, or a budding you know, someone tapping in and just starting to stretch their wings or get their wings back might be the better term. Yeah. That anything that is a being of light can be mistaken as an angel. I think of the angels as facilitating our high soul will. So they deal with healing and those levels of things, energy yeah. healing. But I think of guides as facilitating our material will and assisting us with some of the physical things that have to occur here. And then, of course, spirits being people, and they are not our guides. They're more like ancestors. They can assist or lend a hand for sure, or oversee us or be present. All of these things can overlap. Your guide can be an ex-relative or great-grandpa or something. Somebody completely disconnected, you know. Yeah, they can serve to help us as well. And discerning spirits in differentiating them, classifying and identifying them, the categories just keep expanding. It's amazing. It's a matrix. It's wonderful. Have you ever been to a trumpet seance? I have, although it was done in complete darkness, so I can't say I saw anything. I think you're referring to that sort of extended... They call it a trumpet. It looks like a long cone of tin, light tin or aluminum. It's like a megaphone. Tell yeah. people about that. They might not have heard. And Gavin, I'm not sure we're going to get to the exercise. I may have to have you guys back. What about that? <laughs> That's just terrible. <laughs> oh, Go ahead, Yvonne. Tell us about that. <laughs> Okay, I was fortunate enough to attend two or three while I was doing bachelor research in Orange County, California. And at one of the trumpet seances, our daughter, who came four years later, said, may I be your little girl? And I said, oh, yes. There's another kind that a very special medium came and did what's called an apport seance, A-P-P-O-R-T, where the guides bring physical objects to us from the yes. other side. Yes. And I was given a beautiful green stone, a green gem, not faceted, but cabochon cut, if you know what that is. It's a dome yes. shape cut. And this was green. When I picked it up off the carpet, it was still warm. Oh, how interesting. Yeah. And I, yes. And I had it set as a bracelet in a silver colored chain and wore that unceasingly until we opened our pig farm in Missouri. <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> we'll have to talk chapter. about pig farms in Missouri later. <laughs> but anyway, oh. no, because I, a long thing. Um, pigs are sensitive too. You've got to worry about pigs. Absolutely they are. I hear their intelligence is much higher than dogs. 
Right. Pig breeders say if pigs had thumbs, we'd all be in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> Probably so. I love what you said about may I be your little girl, the, oh, yeah. the person that came through like that. And what I'm finding in maybe a handful of readings over the last year are children that chose not to stay in physical form. And some of them have crossed over. Obviously, they do. But um, others have chosen to grow up beside someone and just chosen them as a parent and decided they wanted to just grow up in their energy field. And it's not like a traumatic situation like your little Native American girl that you helped to find her way or the other little girl that was bound with fear about her times table. But very happily, just across the invisible barrier, staying in the energy of the mother, I'm just like, wow, that's so cool. We do have just about three minutes left in the show. Gavin, do you have something that would fit in that time frame that you'd like to share with our listeners? why not? Let's try it anyway. Thank you. Come with me. Close your eyes. Relax. And imagine yourself on a path that leads up the side of a hill. And at the bottom of the hill, there's a party going on that you're part of. And everybody's very happy. But you know that you really ought to climb the hill because you're sure that there's some meaning in it. And as you leave the party, it turns out that the party is in shadow. But when the path goes up the hill, you come into a warm place where you can hear a brook trickling over stones and you can smell a pine forest. And so you walk up the hill And you walk up the hill, and it gets warmer and hotter. And suddenly there's a flash of light, and you suddenly feel empowered. You don't know why or what's happened, but you're empowered. As you go down the other side of the hill, you come to an area, you might imagine yourself to be right now in Syria, in a destroyed town. And there are people there, and they're begging for food. But you know, with your new inspiration, that it's not food they want, it's hope and love. And so you reach out to them, and everyone you reach out to suddenly starts to smile back at you. And they're reinvigorated from your energy, this energy that you gained. And you can do it any time you like. You can go to the top of the hill gain some energy and take it down into these derelict areas and reinvigorate the people there so that they are happier and friendlier with one another and that they will turn around and in the ruins they will plant things so that they can grow their own food. Thank you so much. That is a vision that would change the world. Thank you so much, Gavin and Yvonne Frost, for joining me today. For those of you listening, you can find more information about them at wicca.org, W-I-C-C-A dot org. Thank you again for joining us today. You've made it a pleasure, Tracy. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Blessed. Blessed be. Blessed be. So we're going to leave our party and we're going to go out and do some work, right? (laughs) Sounds like a plan. It makes a difference. It changes the vibration of the world, what you just talked about. Thank you yes. so much. And blessed be to both of you. Blessed be. Blessed be, Tracy. We'll see you next week for a view of life from a medium's perspective. And remember, it's never inappropriate to be kind. And without integrity, you have nothing. Blessings. Blessings.